Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Lorabai, or Maddie, and today I'm reading chapter 20 of Hashtag Murder Trending by Gretchen McNeil. Let's get right into it. As Dee trekked across the, the, trekked across the island towards, toward, toward ice cream, she couldn't stop obsessing over Mary's theory about Molly Muller's true identity. Dee knew for, uh, that from Paniac fan fiction. Dee knew that Paniac fan fiction was a huge thing on the Postman form. Monica had, Monica had described some of her her favorites that had been written about Gucci. He had a he had been a designer. One he had been a designer for a major fashion label, and he snapped and. And he snapped after he was fired. Number two, he and his wife owned an exclusive boutique in Manhattan, and he used to run a he used to run fashion boot camps for kids during the summer. Number three, he was an enter entertainer in South Beach, who had been a contestant on RuPaul's Drag Race. Number four. He was a long-haul trucker from Mississippi who had turned his rig into a mobile torture chamber. None of these stories were actual theories about the true identity of Gucci Hangman, only elaborate stories from the minds of his most ardent fans. Monica, no, Mira's facts, faxes and quotations, about Molly Muller could have been the could have been the same thing, fiction. The real world world identities of the Paniacs were closely guarded secrets. The news media and tabloids alike had been attempted to seek out. Alike had attempted to seek them out, but not a single shred of evidence had been had been found had been found that unmasked any of them not even after caped captain's death which had in initiated a media feeding frenzy obituaries had been scoured screen screen grabs of caption analyzed by experts along alongside photos of recently deceased males from across the country. There had been dozens of theories, but in the end, nothing had been confirmed and the topic had been dropped. So Mira's carpooling, carpool driving, stay-at-home mom version of Molly Muller had to be one more wild speculation, right? She couldn't actually know a Paniac's identity, could she? And it seemed unlikely, but if there, if there was even a snowball's chance in hell that Mira had some kind of in inside information about one of the Paniacs, Dee needed to know it. Anything to help her survive for another... Anything to help her survive for an, the next 28 hours because, like he he told her last night, in 28 hours, Niles would be meeting his, would be meeting his lawyer, lawyers and asking them to contact Dee's dad with a special me message. Gucci Hangman killed Monica. Your daughter was framed. While Dee wasn't 100% sure that, that Gucci was Monica's killer, the situation wouldn't take too long to explain. This version was simple, to the point, and hopefully her dad would act on it. He will. I know he will. I hope he will. <clears throat> Ice cream was a much-needed distraction. Hanging out with Griselda wouldn't have been Dee's first choice for how to spend her day, but the ice cream shop was crazy busy as if all 27 inmates on the on the island wanted ice cream sundaes to be their last meal 
and the hours flew by. Niles ar arrived around noon, having him there helped. He kept the conversation light, never referencing Alcatraz 2.0 or the Paniacs or his meeting at the guard station the next day. They talked about Califor Cor California and British poetry and who made a better Sherlock Holmes, Benedict Cumberbatch or Robert Downey Jr. I really hope I said his name right because I'm pretty sure he's a real person. <laughs> And before Dean knew it, Ethan had shown, shown up for their trek back to the barracks. And just when Dee thought she couldn't, and just when Dee thought she'd make it through the, make it through a day on Alcatraz 2.0 without a murder, a sound ripped through the shop that sent shivers down her spine. Ding dong, ding dong. Here we go again, Griselda said, seemingly unaffected by the notification. Did she never fear this place? Meanwhile, Dee's heart raced as she swung around to face the monitor. The scene was another warehouse, suitably dismissal, a brooding light permitted... Yeah, permitted the near darkness... Just enough to illuminate the abandoned, detritus sown, detritus skewn, shrewn about the interior. Wooden crates stacked hap haphazardly across the walls, hunks of machinery, and thick chains hanging from. The rafters like vines in an industrial jungle. The details were fuzzy and indistinguishable, which allowed Dee's mind to fill, to fill in the ominous blanks. Images of torture and brutality were hard to shake. A spotlight ripped through the warehouse. It panned to the left, glint, glinting off the rusting metal chains, then then settled. On a giant disc in the middle of the room, painted like an archery target in festive shades of yellow, uh, red, yellow, and blue. Tied, tied eagle spread in the middle was a woman. That's odd, Niall said at, Niall said at Dee's, at Dee's side. I haven't seen her before. I'm always informed when new inmates arrive. He sound he sounded peeved. That's my job. The woman wore a sparkly gold leotard, appropriate for a magician's assistant, and her black hair had been curled in fat spirals, which covered her face as she as she hung her head forward, but when the woman raised raised her her face to the camera, he recognized it right right away, even though the woman's mouth was obscured by a gag. Dee knew her face; it was one she'd never forget. Holy shit, that's Doctor Farouk. Only the words hadn't come from from D, they'd come from Griselda. You know her? D asked. Griselda's upper lip curled. She's that bitch face psychiatrist. She's that bitch face psychiatrist who testified against me at my trial. D's hands began to tremble. She's the same bitch face psychiatrist who testified against me. Me too, Ethan said. Bitch face. For the first time since Dee had met her, Griselda's calm, cool exterior crap cracked. That's impossible, she said, the tremor apparent in her voice. My my trial was in Chicago, Ethan's was in, in New York, and yours was in LA. 
They wouldn't have used the same doctor for all three, but they did, Dee said, as if Dr. Farouk had testified against all three of them. If Dr. Farouk had testified against all three of them, maybe Griselda really was innocent after all. Dee's trial ended just days ago. Niall said, How did the doctor get here so fast? She needed to be arrested. She needed to be arrested. Tried. D was thinking the exact same thing. How did Dr. Farouk end up on Alcatraz 2.0? A voice cracked. A voice crackled from the screen. Pray thee, mistress. Dost thou knowest who I am? Dr. Farouk nodded meekly. Anyone with half a brain could recognize one of Robin Hood's setups. Dost thou knowest where thou is? Iced. Damn, the way the way Robin's Hood talks is hard to pronounce. <laughs> Again she noticed she nodded. And dost thou knowest why thou art here? This time Dr. Farouk shook her head violently tried to speak through the gag, her voice muffled and indistinct. Dr. Farouk, Robin said, his voice louder as if he were a town crier about to read a proclamation. You have been convicted of psychiatric malpractice during your time at Western Syria State Mental Hospital. resulting in the negligent death of a patient, derailed Western Syria State Mental Hospital, where Kiyomi had been sent. Are you okay? Niles axed his hand on Dee's back. You look as if you're going to be sick. I'm fine. Dee pulled a chair away from the nearest table and sat down. The room around her spun. The room spun around her. First, the connection between Gucci and Monica's death. Now, Dr. Farouk, who had been so inter, inst- who, who'd been so intermittent, <sighs> who'd been so instrumental in Dee's conviction, was directly linked to the hospital where Dee's kidnapper had been sent six years ago. Did this conspiracy go deeper than Dee realized? Meanwhile, Dr. Fruit screamed through her gag, less from fear, more than from indignation. She looked furious as if she tried to spit the fabric band out of her mouth, but her, her cries were quickly drowned out by a creeptastical or pipe organ soundtrack. As slow, as slowly the archery target began to spin. Now let's bear witness to your demise, Robin said. May God have mercy on thy eton- eternal soul. Doctor Fruke's head swiveled from side to side as the rotating target began to pick up speed. She was looking for an escape, just did as Dee had done. Dr. Fruk's anger faded and she started to panic. She twisted her body, wrenching her torso back and forth as she pulled frantically at her arms and legs, attempting to free herself from the bonds that restrained her, but the ropes held firm. Thou do- dost squirm too much. Robin cackled. Dost thou want me to miss? With a whoosh and a thwack, an arrow flew through the air and struck the target three inches to the left of her her hair. Three inches to the left of her head. <laughs> Another hiss of air and a second arrow hit just below her right arm then a third between her legs 
Dr. Farouk was hysterical now. The tear trails arching across her cheeks as the target continued to spin, and despite and despite the anger she held towards the psychiatrist, Dee felt her fear so tangibly it was as if she was there, strapped to the target in her place, no escape, no reprieve, the end in the end in sight, and she couldn't help but pity the doctor. Robin chuckled. Would, would thou, wouldst thou, wouldst thou, I use a larger weapon? <sighs> I'm really struggling with the way Robin Hood talks, or Robin's Hood. The music stopped. Anticipating building, building, anticipation building in silence. A crack shattered the quiet as an enormous wooden stake was propelled at Dr. Farouk's body with such force that it impaled her stomach. This time, her scream was blood curdling, her eyes wide in pain and terror as the life slowly drained from her body. The wheel stopped turning. Her head lolled forward. Listen to the sound of my voice, Robin said, strangely out of character. Relax into the past and tell me what you see. Then the video went black. And that is the end of chapter 20. I shall see you guys next time. Bye bye